Candace. And I'm Ripley. And I'm John. And this is Come Explaining. The show where I'm Hawkeye and I'm the best at what I do. Oh my god, you really, <laughs> really went for it. I really, really did. We're always looking for something ridiculous to watch on Disney Plus, some ridiculous Marvel thing we can watch before we record, just to get us in the spirit. Because we keep on getting spoiled by the classic 90s X-Men cartoon. So they are no longer allowed to watch it. I have not continued without them, despite wanting to. So now (laughs) we are watching Avengers United We Stand. It's so bad. (laughs) It's really bad. Hawkeye sounds like Wolverine. He's really gruff for no reason. He's also super, like, bigger than everyone else for some reason. (laughs) (laughs) And he was a part of the Circus of Crime. Well, that's... I think they got integrated into the Circus of Crime after the fact. Yeah. Mm. You know... These carnivals just buy one another out. I'm sorry, I don't know the deep Hawkeye lore. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he is a carny, that's true. He is, that yeah. is true. Ex carny, assumedly. <laughs> and that's a. That and hearing problems, and that's all I got. Really. Iron Man villain. I didn't remember that. Former Iron Man villain. Y- you know, ha- because... Has uh, a flame for Natasha. Yeah. A-, a guy who uh, shoots arrows is going to be very dangerous to a guy in a metal suit. Yeah, obviously. Oh, Natural uh, predator. Falcon's <laughs> lips are green. Falcon, sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes they're green. It's his battle look lipstick. His battle lipstick. Uh, Ultron stole Wonder Man. Yeah. Yeah. They just... They for just, reasons. Like, they just let that happen and... Uh, Moving on. Uh, <laughs> and Captain America, Thor, and Iron Man are not here, but we're not going to explain why. Uh, apparently, they thought there were going to be rights issues. And apparently, <laughs> there weren't rights issues. <laughs> but wow. they, by the time they learned there weren't rights issues, it was too late. It, it was too late. <laughs> Ant Man was in charge of the Avengers, and it was all downhill from there. Well, he did create a horror beyond our comprehension, which is very on brand by putting some of Wonder Man mind into Vision who did not have anything like that in him. I mean, some of that tracks. I don't know exactly how that worked, but... But, yeah. but that is a horror beyond our comprehension and that is very Hank Pym. I think we should just learn that Hank should not be in charge of the of anything, really. I mean, yeah. I already knew that. I mean, like, he can do his own thing, but he should probably not be in charge is what I've taken he away sh- from Hank Pym. He should uh-huh. not be in charge of anything at all, ever. Just do your thing and vibe, little buddy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and as long as vibing, as long as vibing doesn't involve creating horrors beyond our comprehension. Which anyway, he does a lot. We're not here to talk about Avengers, unfortunately. Unfortunately, you want well, to talk about Avengers? No, no, I don't. <laughs> what happened last time with the X Men? Count Nefaria invaded NATO. Close, NORAD. NORAD, that's I can the see one. how you'd get switched up, though. Uh, Count Nefaria invaded NORAD because he wanted something. To hold the world hostage. Oh, right, he wanted money. <laughs> one yes. million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and the Avengers couldn't make it, so they passed the job off to the X-Men. <laughs> they were too busy. <laughs> they were busy. Couldn't busy. clear their busy schedule. <laughs> Yeah, at least they take phone calls. <laughs> so the X-Men went there and they got inside after a lot of fucking nonsense. <laughs> With animal people. With Well, the animal the people came after that. The plane blew up. The plane blew up well, first. Well, technically the, the animal. animal people were before that, but you know. I guess. <laughs> but the X-Men weren't dealing with the animal people until after the plane blew up. Yes. yes. The plane that looked very wrong. But there was a bunch of furries. um, (laughs) There there, there were furries, yes. They got inside and then they fought the furries. And then um, uh, Banshee got thrown at Thunderbird. (laughs) So they got knocked out. So everyone else was like, all right, well, let's go deal with this thing because this shit is about to explode. (laughs) Because Count Nefari is a fucking moron and... (laughs) Doesn't know that the thing he activated is going to kill everyone. But but didn't it suddenly turn out that no, it's not going to explode? Well, no, he turned off, he 
fled because the X-Men were there and he turned on the self-destruct and the X-Men got there and turned it off? Um, I remember no. something about it. They did something and it turned out to deactivate the self-destruct and they didn't know it. Their fight broke everything uh, on the base. Uh, <laughs> yes. Because there was, there was this one moment that felt very The most ridiculous and contrived <laughs> bullshit. It was a load-bearing fight. So yeah, well, everything didn't explode, <laughs> but Count Nefaria was getting away on an airplane that you guys knew what it was. Uh, that was a Harrier, <laughs> wasn't it? It was. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> and then um, Banshee and Thunderbird saw him and Thunderbird jumped on the plane as it was taking off and... Boom. Yeah, he, he died. Beat, he beat the plane to death. <laughs> he beat the plane to death, but he also died. Yeah. Equivalent exchange, I guess. Rip Banshee. We... No, not no, Banshee. Banshee. Rip Thunderbird. Thunderbird. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, we, we didn't know you, and now we will never know you. Uh, well, we learned a little bit about him. We learned some about him. No, not... Okay, we will know about you in a decade. <laughs> Because that was the other part of the story. Yes. Oh, we had a couple other things Yes. So the X-Men took his body back to his family. And I guess his parents were like... Thank you, but go. Thanks, but go away. Our son is dead. Yeah, you still still killed him. Uh, Kinda. Kinda. You got him killed. You got him killed. Exactly. And his little brother stole his body. Which was a little weird. <laughs> which is normal. <laughs> and took it out to the desert. And was doing like funeral thing. And also took his title from the sound of things. Yeah. So you know, in give give or take a decade, we might Baby pick that, Thunderbird. And pick that storyline back up. Yeah, so that happened. And then we also read a story where Oro oh, yeah. and Jean went on a date. Yes, they very much went on a date because she because Jean likes a project. <laughs> we learned that Oro does not know how to wear clothes, and she has a fear of claustrophobia. I, yeah, she has claustrophobia, and Jean just can't help but try to help people through things. Mm-hmm. So she dug in her mind, which pissed Aurora off. Which is fair. Very fair. But then they kind of even things out, and so, and then they walked down into the subway, confronting Mm -hmm. Storm Spears together. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now that we've got that done, our first issue this week is X-Men 96 from September of 1975. You may notice that the last issue of X-Men is from July of 1975. That would be because at this point, X-Men only comes out once every other month. Oof. Yikes. Yep. They were not ready to commit to this comic yet. Not just yet. Wanted to test run it a little bit. Kick the tires. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this one's plotted by Bill Mantlo, written by Chris Claremont, penciled by Dave Cockrum, inked by Sam Granger, colored by Phil Rachelson, and lettered by David Hunt. Since we're using the classic X-Men version of this story, we're also including some pages featuring Jack Abel on inks, Elaine Lee on colors, and Bill Oakley on letters. We've got two new names, though, Bill Matlow, and let's just turn things around. Bill Matlow is actually the ex-husband of famed colorist Karen Matlow, so jot that down. (laughs) But a fun Bill Matlow fact is that he actually moved on into law school and found work as a public defender. Well. Before some sad things in his life happened, but Uh. he was a public defender. Elaine Lee is also something of a Renaissance woman, as she is also a comic book writer and an Emmy Award-nominated actress. Wow. Oh. Finally a woman we can actually know things about. <laughs> the first. <laughs> One more moment to note that these comics are being told in a very abridged fashion, and if you want to fully appreciate them, we encourage you to read along with us. You can even join our comic book club on Discord, reading along with us and discussing the book after the fact. We open on Scott Summers, walking the grounds of the mansion. Whoa. In full costume. Oh, of course. As um, you do. That sure is a... It's, yeah, this page is a lot. Yeah. It's just the title choice. And it's also, like, really small. 
on this page. Yeah, it does seem all kind of smushed in together, doesn't it? Okay, so a choice. Oh, oh, there was probably text and crap down there. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, maybe yeah. Or the or maybe right stuff. Yeah, or, I know what you or mean. Or advertising. No, no? they they wouldn't put like advertising there. Stuff. Yeah, I yeah. Was th- my first thought: copyright stuff. But while the autumn sky around him blooms in color, Scott only sees darkness, dwelling on Thunderbird's death. Though it was always a possibility, it was never something so real until now. The guilt falls heavily on his shoulders as he is plagued by a big old case of what-ifs and the horror of watching his friend and teammate die before his eyes. It's been a few weeks since Proud Star's passing, but it still remains heavy in his heart and head. They'd saved the world, but traded that for their comrade's death. And while it was what had to be done, the pain of the latter feels more significant than the achievement of the former. We really just got a a full flashback of that. Yep, it's a nice way to kind of what happened last time. Yeah, I guess it has been a month, hasn't it? Yeah, two months. months. Two months. Woohoo. Yikes. Angry over the unfairness at it, Scott lashes out blasting out blindly at the forest around him, leaving wreckage in his wake. After a moment's release, Scott comes to his senses, embarrassed at letting himself slip. Because that's the one thing Scott never allows himself. He beats himself up over it. After all, death always was a possibility, and he'd known it. At which point, I would like to interject that you were a child when you accepted that price? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hey, hey, child... Former child soldier Scott Summers, uh, this isn't on you. In his head, he's the top man. He accepted that responsibility, and so the show must go on. He passes on a hope for John to rest in peace as he walks away from the wreckage of the nearby forest, including a cairn that got blasted in Sykes' lash out, looming ominously in the foreground. I was wondering what that was about. What is this thing he hit with his eye beams? It's just a cairn. Yeah, just your average run-of-the-mill cairn. You know, in New like England. we all have just laying in the forest. It's common in New England. It's actually a feature. Yeah. So, when you buy property. So, so it he comes des- with a cairn. He destroyed a property feature. He's damaged the property value. Good job, Scott. Well, I think Charles is used to this kind of thing at this point. His house keeps getting blown up and invaded. <laughs> Well, the property values must be terrible in that neighborhood. I don't think so. It's a fucking mansion. Yes, but it, a mansion that keeps on getting destroyed and rebuilt on a regular basis. There's... It's rebuilt. It looks lovely now. Yeah. Let's turn our attention. It's called renovations, John. <laughs> <laughs> I bet he puts in new features every time he does it just to More make his house tentacles. better. <laughs> More wall tentacles, God. Let's turn our attention across the grounds where the rest of the X-Men are fooling around in the danger room. Colossus accidentally swats Wolverine across the room, <laughs> which of course means it's time to get him back for it, claws out. Aurora is having none of this, and she whoops him right backwards on his rear with a gust of wind. Now because this is hilarious, Kurt laughs, which old Wolvie doesn't take too kindly to. He jumps at him, but Kurt bamfs out of the way, and he's fine. Banshee's like, chill, you could have killed him, to Wolverine's like, yeah, I know. I was trying to. Charles is used to this kind of bullshit, so instead he just takes Sean aside. Cassidy has noticed how worn down Charles has seemed since Thunderbird's death, but Charles instead is concerned about how hard Scott is taking it. Before he can really get into it, he realizes that the housekeeper he hired to watch over his house should be here at any moment. Before we can find out just where he's off to to need a housekeeper, the doorbell rings, and since it's going to take a while for Charles to wheel himself on down there, Banshee just peels off towards the door, rushing to let the woman in. He doesn't have high hopes for the housekeeper, expecting an ugly old crone or something, but when he sassily opens the door on Moira McTaggart, the Scotswoman gives him back everything he gave, (laughs) and more. Upstate in the Adirondack Mountains, a Dr. Lang paces anxiously in the hangar of his covert installation, eagerly awaiting the landing of a courier plane from D.C. He's so close to achieving his goals that he's becoming nervous at the idea of actually finishing his work. This guy is dressed normally. Is that a real plane? I didn't identify that one. I don't know that one. (laughs) Because VTOL, or even uh, short takeoff and landing, was very not a thing back then as far as I know. 
then I'm going to say no. I don't. I, I, I didn't think to look this plane up. Because <laughs> as far as I know, this wasn't something anyone really succeeded until the age of computer-aided navigation and uh, control. Uh, fly by... Uh, well, this is wire. super comic sci-fi. Maybe they got the design from Reed Richards. Or... S.H.I.E.L.D. has a giant fucking helicarrier. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck are you talking about? We're seeing real aircraft now. It's weird. That doesn't mean they make it to the consumer field, but this is the military. They get all the goodies. No, I mean, this is this is the secret military. Yes, this is the, not, yes, this, this is, is the, the double secret se- military. This isn't the, these aren't real aircraft. These are double secret aircraft. Finally, the plane lands, and Colonel Michael Rossi departs from the aircraft, explaining that Lang's project has not yet been fully approved, and they want a final report before they make their decision. And guess what? Rossi's the inspector. Lang knows that bodes ill for him. Apparently, they were once close friends before Project Armageddon became an obsession that consumed Lang for the sake of capturing a few mutants. Uh, oh boy. that face... That face is a lot. Um, See, this is what Project Armageddon is all about. Capturing mutants to study them so as to be ready for the ultimate conflict between Homo sapiens and Homo superior. Between man and mutant. The... <laughs> the... You mean the the race war? Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. imminent race war? Oh Find out the exact God. date. The <laughs> Find race out the exact war. date date of the race war so you see what i was talking about when i was saying man it's really hard to read these comics sometimes the race war and then i look over to (laughs) (laughs) yeah boy so anyway it's us or them kill or be killed there's no other way good god yep He's probably got a sock full of bullet casings himself. <laughs> He's collecting his dryer lint. <laughs> For the apocalypse. It's all gonna burn. <laughs> all of it. He then continues on with his spiel as to why it is that everyone is ignoring the threat. Sure, they only know about the mutants in the Avengers and the X-Men. There are others out there, surely massing to do something. He saw what happened to Boulevard Trask, to his son, Boulevard Trask's death was apparently his Ruby Ridge. Oh, God. (laughs) But he's going to succeed where they failed. He prepared for everything, unlike the others who surely did not. But what he didn't prepare for was Colonel Rossi's two thumbs way down. Rossi knows that something like this would tear America apart, no matter how necessary Lang thinks it is. Uh, Most of America doesn't want a race war. I'm sorry. And so it's going to be a no from him. It seems like a fairly quick visit from old Mikey, but he's headed back to Washington. But Lang has no intention of letting him make it that far. It's not time to winter the pool for the fall just yet. The day has been unseasonably warm, and so Aurora has gone for a few laps around the pool. Transition! (laughs) Oh no, Aurora's naked. Yeah, I might know that this is a new page, too, so we added Aurora being naked. This is new content for oh, classic X-Men. Boy. Oh boy. Also, <laughs> Kurt and Espido. Yeah. Well, you know, you gotta do a little bit of fan service for everyone. Fan yeah. service. <laughs> and hey, uh, Wolverine's not wearing a shirt. Yeah. That's fan service for some people. She's soon joined by Kurt, who apparently didn't learn about looking before he leaps, but once he gets an eye full, he tries to ward the rest of the group did, off. Did he just learn to fly? No, he no. just jumped. He jumped. He was startled. That's a pretty high jump, my dude. <laughs> For you see, Storm was swimming in the nude. But before he gets a chance, she climbs out of the pool, telling Kurt off for being so over the top. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Quickly, Piotr offers her the shirt off his own back to cover up with. Oh Piotr also wearing a Speedo. <laughs> Look at Fan his fucking service. face. What else would you Look do? at these faces. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta cut this Kurt for the title card. Okay, but look at blow-up doll Piotr. I, I, that's the one I wanted to zoom in on. The oh is a lot. There's the only one right You can ready see for why it. Bobby left, though. Christ, look at the beefcake out there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but 
The only this one. This guy's walking around your house but if you all go the back, time. The no, only I one ready that. for it. He's the only <laughs> one. Yeah. Well, Logan's. No. Wolverine's into it. Yeah. Well, obviously. Wolverine doesn't have a name, by and, the way. You may have noticed. He's just Wolverine. Oh, my. And, and then there's. God. Piotr really is so much beefcake. Right? Yes. He looks like fucking early Arnold Schwarzenegger with dark hair. Man's an absolute beefcake. Uh, oh, but that shirt looks a little... And then... Yeah, how does that shirt sh- well, shrink she... that much <laughs> yeah. to fit Aurora? <laughs> she's, <laughs> she's wet, so it's clinging. Of course, it that makes long. perfect sense. Look at Piotr and then look at Wolverine. <laughs> 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 oh my god, this fanlet's like nipple high on this giant rusty. <laughs> Piotr has no hair. <laughs> and Wolverine's just... He's all cross hatching. <laughs> well, you know, he's just he has to share his gift with the world. <laughs> yeah. His gift being these guns. <laughs> oh my god. Oh god. Charles feels the spike of emotion coming from the pool. <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> and then urges Aurora to please try to cover up in the future, if only to keep the peace. Spike of emotion, yes, that's one way to refer to it. He then returns to conversation with Moira. Moira, cl- Moira slyly critiques Charles's use of the phrase indiscretion, feeling that Aurora's innocence on the matter shouldn't be seen that way, and maybe that says more about anyone else than it does Aurora. Charles isn't used to these kinds of issues with his <laughs> X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> his ch- former child soldiers didn't used to walk around They naked. were all programmed just perfectly. Yes! But Moira is of the opinion that the change would do Xavier good. Charles mentions a romance past, but Moira dismisses it, instead wanting to hear more about his new X-Men. Finally, at the end of a long day, the X-Men have mostly gathered in the kitchen for dinner, though Scott still wanders the grounds. It looks like we've moved from those extra pages. Yep. Yep. You can notice it in the lettering very closely. I noticed it in the line work and the coloring. Yeah. But I did notice it in the lettering. Yep. The lettering's a very apparent one for me. I don't know why, know, but it is different. It stands they have a much heavier inking style. Yeah, to... they, they didn't even try to make a match, which is an interesting choice. Well, what are you going to do unless you hire the exact people and say, do it like you did then? Do it like you did and, a decade ago. Right, exactly. As Harness you... what you were doing, the level of skill you were at 10 yeah. years as ago. If, as if you haven't gotten better in a decade. You are still working, right? <laughs> Yeah, we've met, we've run into several people who aren't. Well, they have gathered in the kitchen for dinner, and Moira finally gets her chance to meet the X-Men other than Scott. Uh, hey, hey, Wolverine, stop that. Charles intends for her to watch after the X-Men, as he explains that he's off on a little vacation. Wolverine is destroying the furniture like a badly behaved cat. <laughs> <laughs> Who's surprised, really? <laughs> Feral. Absolutely feral. You can't play that game of tic-tac-toe again. <laughs> you you should have, you, you could have carved out the, the board Poor for Xavier it, but... just rubbing at his temples. <laughs> as, as and Wolverine he's also got to be playing furniture. against himself. <laughs> yes, that's the worst part. He's playing it against himself. I'm the best at what I do. And, and what, what I, I do, do is play tic-tac-toe. tic-tac-toe. Sean has taken an immediate liking to McTaggart, and while the rest of the X-Men seem to have also given her their seal of approval, Storm wonders why Charles trusts her with their secret, but he won't explain, instead asking where Scott is. This was apparently a cue to enter, as before Storm has so much of a chance to answer, Scott is thrown through the glass window, costume in tatters. Oh boy. Uh, uh, what the <laughs> fuck? Sean goes to help him up, with little thought to the fact that Scott didn't just, like, jump through the window. <laughs> no, it's fine. This is normal. But the rest see Kirok, Shatterer of Souls. Kirok, the Slayer of Men, in all his glory. What? Here for their souls. What the fuck is this? Presumably to shatter their souls. Probably. <laughs> How would you describe Kirok to our listeners? Uh, he looks like a generic demon. Not... Exactly. Like, he looks like someone was thinking, I want to make a demon, but it's like 1970. I also want to make a dragon, kind of. And an alien? (laughs) And I'm not really sure what this is, so it's kind of 
a bunch of things at once. Yep, so generic monster. <laughs> yep. Karak is mostly aggravated Scott woke him up from his nap, and so he wants vengeance in the form of lives. How about Xavier? He looks like the leader, so him first. Storm isn't going to go for that, catching Kirok's claws for her trouble. Ooh. Colossus won't see a lady, a comrade, <laughs> treated this way, and just bodily checks him across the room. That didn't really do much to stop Kirok, child of the Elder Gods, the Ingarai, and he quickly gives Colossus a dose of his own medicine, chucking a heavy metal hunk of something at him. Nightcrawler jumps into the fray, but his vest isn't enough to down the uh, younger god, who sends Kurt too flying across yeah, the room. Yeah, Kurt, uh, he just bodied Colossus. What are you gonna do? <laughs> and Kirok cries, Kirok does not fall to such as you, changeling. Wolverine apparently didn't much care for that mostly <laughs> nothing statement. Jumping to his buddy's defense, he rips and tears at Kirok, tearing him a couple new ones until mm. Kirok finally lays still on the ground. Wolverine notes how easily he let his anger pull him into a berserker rage. But you know what's funny? He's glad he didn't. And Scott's like, oh yeah, you know what's funnier? Kirok isn't dead. Oh my god. Oh my god. But I... I'm glad I waited to flip the page. (laughs) Holy shit. Look at his face. Oh my god. He's, He's the... He doesn't stop being sad. Oh my god! But, <laughs> I, but I wanted to kill him! But I killed him! I'm so good at killing! It's the, I'm the best at what I do! I am the best at this! My clothes are just so stabby and good at killing! How can he not be dead? That takes the wind out of Wolverine's sails, as Psyche explains that isn't, this isn't the first time Carrick's been down, as Psyche downed him a dozen times on his way back to the house. Uh, so he's not that strong, huh? Uh, okay, so... No, no, uh, no. Each time he came back stronger, uh, while Cyclops himself felt weaker. I see. Uh, so now he has some, what, Wolverine in him? <laughs> That's enough to prod Charles to look at his X-Men, noting that they all seem weaker, as if their life force is being siphoned from them. Uh-oh. As before their eyes, Kirok begins to reform yet again. Charles sends a mind probe deep into Kirok's mind, but what he sees doesn't quite agree with him as he dissolves into screaming. Cassidy screams right back at Kirok, while Moira reminds us that the mansion has an arsenal oh as god. she comes out toting her AK. Oh my god. <laughs> she got, that's a, what, a M4? So it's been a bad day then. <laughs> they, they just have, just pulls a gun and starts shooting the thing. That's an answer, all right? I gotta say, it was a bad day. <laughs> Well, I, he hired the right person. Even though Banshee may have just found his ideal woman. <laughs> <laughs> Even if she's not really on Kirok's level and should probably just stay out of danger. The professor finally begins to stir from his position on the floor. Scott reports that while they're holding Kirok off, it's not going great. Charles finally has an answer, ordering Storm off to seal the cairn. She soars on the night winds, flying over the grounds in search of the cairn when there it is. But it's not entirely free of danger. While Aurora has her eyes set on the cairn, it seems that Kirok is not the only monster to have made his way from its depths, as other monsters attack her from the ground. One of their bullets strikes home, seizing Monroe with a fierce cold that with her immunity to the elements she has never felt. She grabs for one of the creatures, finding it only made of light and smoke, she blasts the pest back with a blinding bolt of lightning, but it finds herself over the cairn, being pulled towards its depths on a tide of monsters. This is a triggering event for Storm, and she can't help but flash back to memories of her past. One moment peacefully walking down the street, holding her mother's hand, the next trapped in debris, calling endlessly for help. Closed in once more, the energy explodes out of her, blasting the cairn to pieces. Uh... So that's a problem. No, apparently that works, because back in the uh, house, Kirok disappears into a poof of smoke and a puddle of pink goo. Oh. Okay. Oh, okay. Why does that work? That's I a... don't know. That does not count as sealing the cairn in my eyes, uh, but hey. Magi- according to the rules of magic, that should not have worked. That I'm... should have let everything loose, right? Right. I would have assumed that, you know, because it came, the thing comes around because it's broken, if you break it more, and shouldn't more happen? Yeah. 
Well, Scott asks the professor for answers, but Charles has none to offer other than his concern that the Ingarai ever return again, even as Aurora lands safely back with the others. But tonight there's been a far less successful landing. Just outside of the small town of Red Hook, Crash landed in an orchard, a military plane burns. All of its occupants dead, including Colonel Michael Rossi. Of course. Of course. We move along to the B story from Classic X-Men 4 from September of 1986. Oh boy. Oh boy. Written by Chris Claremont. Penciled and inked by former National Security Advisor John Bolton. (laughs) (laughs) Or another guy with the same name. You know. Colors by Glynis Ween and letters by Tom Orzachowski. I can feel the fun in this one already. Suddenly, Wolverine. Even more suddenly, Nightcrawler. And someone is going to be tortured by the other. (laughs) (laughs) Kurt bamfs onto Wolverine's back, tagging him up tagging him once on the shoulder before bamfing away, even as Wolverine grabs at the puff of sulfurous smoke where he once was. And yet again, Kurt is back on his back. This time, his tag partner tries another tactic, rolling and throwing Kurt backwards. But the once circus acrobat easily lands in a crouch as Wolverine hand waves at his fancy footwork. Kurt just grins impishly, delighting in indulging in a little panache here and there. You see, here in the X-Men, we have our own swashbuckler. (laughs) (laughs) Wagner then bamfs several times in quick succession, back behind Wolverine once more, and again, noting that despite his disdain, Wolvie has not gotten him yet. (laughs) Finally, he makes contact, elbowing Kurt sharply in the gut. While Kurt doubles over, Wolverine gets a grip on his shirt, pulling his claws as he explains that he was giving Wagner the kid gloves with all that elbowing, given his metal bones. He then claims to want to finish the job with his claws, raising them high and then striking downward, even as he retracts his claws in a tease. (laughs) Uh, I could have killed you at any moment! Ha ha! Now he just offers his friend a hand up. Kurt takes it, and a moment to try to recover from the shock, as Wolverine grins widely. He really thought he was about to die. Great. This is friendly. Kurt then heads off towards the house to get a case of beer, as were the stakes in this game. But Wolverine has other plans. He wants to head into town to get some brewskis. Kurt thinks his beer is superior, but sighs as he pulls a gadget from somewhere suddenly transforming himself into a rather dashing rogue, (laughs) explaining that the Professor got the gadget from Tony Stark, as he briefly changes to look first like Professor X, then Storm, then Wolverine himself. Uh? Irked, Wolverine asks why he's ashamed of the face he was born with. But Kurt explains that sometimes it's just easier to stay in the closet. (laughs) Mm. Yeah, I can feel that. Why make things harder on both of them when he can just do this? Mood. New England is full of little places like this. Old places that have been here since America was a young colony. Harry's Hideaway is just such a place. A tavern that stood in its place since the Revolutionary War. However, the years hadn't been kind to the place, leaving it fairly run down. At least until the current owner, Harry Morrell, took possession of it and, of course, named it after himself. He spruced up the old gal, working hard to make her a warm, welcome place for locals and visitors alike, frequently including the X-Men. The pair sit incorrectly on the booths, discussing Kurt's former life as a circus performer. Sitting wrong on furniture, like (laughs) queers do. As they do. At Wolfie's prompting, Wagner explains that he left the circus when it was bought by a new owner that wanted to remove him from the trapeze and instead just put him in the freak show. Yet again, Wolverine taunts that he's ashamed, which Kurt protests. He just has pride. Pride in himself and his skills. But Wolverine takes a shot again at the image inducer. If he was proud of himself, he'd be here with his own face and his own skin, openly announcing himself as a mutant to the world. But he doesn't because he's scared, which is rich from a guy who at worst just looks like a hairy mountain man. And is yeah. indestructible. Yeah, this is kind of ringing like <laughs> that thing about the X Men movie. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with us. They can't cure us, says Johnny Five Dicks to a girl who kills everyone she touches. <laughs> Kurt 
protests that he's not scared, to which Wolverine challenges him to prove it. An offer of Kurt declines. And Wolverine's just like, chicken. Kurt again points out that Wolverine just looks like a hairy dude, and explains the whole angry mob thing. Even as to himself, he seems to overly credit the mob that they thought he was a murderer, because he's just too good, too good for this world. Too pure. <coughs> Perfect cinnamon roll. <coughs> Kurt blames it on the a a a a a alcohol and takes Wolverine up on his bet, turning the image inducer off, even as Harry comes around with another round for the boys, and is totally chill about it, much to Kurt's astonishment. The two finish off their new drinks before Wolverine begins to usher his intoxicated friend towards the exit. One of the patrons stares at the departing man, proclaiming, That man's face! He has a tail! To which Harry responds, I... And a handsome one it is, too. Ooh. Okay, Harry. <laughs> Harry's got a type. We're getting real queer representation from <laughs> Harry Morell here. Oh, oh, boy. <laughs> He's a bear. <laughs> <laughs> Found himself a twink. Uh, no, there's a word for... Otter. An otter. He found himself a little otter. Yeah, because Kurt is extremely hairy. <laughs> but very live. Yes. <laughs> John's dying. <laughs> As Kurt walks the streets, not every person is as nonchalant about Kurt's appearance as Harry was. Although, I kind of love the fact that Kurt's wearing that outfit and just... Yeah, I don't know why he's not just wearing normal clothes. I guess he didn't think about it because he just put the gadget on and now he's stuck in his circ costume. But he has a regular hat. I think that he just... I guess he brought the hat. I don't know why he brought the hat and not anything else. Well, self-consciousness begins to rise in Nightcrawler as the people continue to stare, but as he goes, he starts to lean into it, emulating his idols, Errol Flynn and Fred Astaire, tipping his hat even at the staring people. When he spots a woman struggling to carry her grocery bag from the store, dropping one on the concrete, he comes to the woman's assistance, picking the bag off the ground and passing it to her, and planting one on her cheek. Ooh, boy. You can't do that without asking, Kurt. <laughs> She's into it, though, finding the whole encounter and Kurt rather dashing. <laughs> of course she is. He is fairly debonair. He it's might true. be able to pull it off. He also likes Star Wars. Yeah, Kurt's trip down the street continues, passing by some young boys outside a nearby theater, excited to watch Star Wars again. Kurt, too, is a fan of Star Wars. He teasingly mentions that his favorite character is Chewbacca, much like his hairy little friend. <laughs> <laughs> The kids don't have any hate for Kurt, though they do think he's an alien. <laughs> oh my god. And given the world they're in, it... he could be. He could be. Yeah. But while it works down the street, Kurt's gained some looks of disgust. He's not done just yet. When a big blonde giant, flanked by two smaller blonde cronies, stops him in his tracks, taunting that they'll let anything walk the streets. Kurt is very suave and restrained with, his, with an I beg your pardon. And then they pick at his accent. And then Blondie Locks puts his hands on him, trying to tell Kurt just what he looks like. But Kurt is still suave in response. And then the guy grabs his face and is even less chill when he realizes this isn't a mask. Kurt just tries to wave him off, but Wolverine isn't having any of it. He runs, he runs at the big un. Oh yeah, Wolverine was following him this whole time to make sure he was okay. Yeah, because yeah, he was intoxicated. <laughs> That's cute. So he runs at the bigot, tackling him round the middle and readying his claws to fillet him like a uh, fish. Hey, 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 Wolverine, no murder! Kurt quickly jumps onto his friend's shoulders, bamping the both of them away to the roof of a nearby building. Wolverine wishes he could have finished him off, but Kurt waves it off, instead proud of himself and glad that he took Wolverine's dare and showed himself to the world. <laughs> and Wolverine did almost kill a dude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he did it for friendship. I know, <laughs> but if it weren't for Kurt thinking quick, friendship might have murdered someone. <laughs> well, he's on guard. He knows. He knows how Wolverine is. So we're going to move along to X Men '97 from November of 1975, written by Chris Claremont, penciled by Dave Cockrum, inks by Sam Granger. Colors by Don Warfield, and lettered by Annette Kowicki. We're going to be using the classic X-Men version of the story, so this is featuring some new pages with John Bolton penciling and inking, Elaine Lee coloring, and Bill Oakley on letters. 
We've got a couple new names here in Don Warfield and Annette Kowicki. So what little factoid can I come up with for them? Don Warfield existed. Annette Kowicki also existed. On with the show. I would like to know that this is where it really begins. Early to mid Claremont X-Men has this freight train energy to it. It takes a while to get rolling down the tracks, but once it's moving, woe be upon you if you're stuck a mile down them. <laughs> I would say that we wake on Charles Xavier sleeping fitfully, but I don't think that really fits the heights of the theatrics we get into. Yeah, so. this is dr- wow. dramatic. Wow. <clears throat> the Bard of Avon said it best, to sleep perchance to dream. Aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. And if the dreams of the dead must give us pause, what then of the dreams of the living? For example, the dreams of Charles Xavier. No, please, no. Let me be, I beg of you. Get out of my mind and let me be. In the name of all that's holy, get out of my mind. How would you guys explain Charles' dream? I think I've seen this cartoon. It's a clusterfuck. (laughs) Yeah, it is kind of a clusterfuck. There's a lot going on, including some space shit. But it doesn't just remain there. For you see, of late, Charles has had this nightmare time and again. Oh boy. A vicious battle rages in space, and Charles Xavier feels the lives aboard each ship extinguished as the battle takes its toll. And then the guns stop, though one small scout ship slips away. And still, despite his wishes, the dream continues. His need to know of the pilot of the ship draws him ever deeper into the craft itself, but before its inhabitant can remove their helmet, the dream ends. He awakens with a yell before finally calming himself slightly. I like the acknowledgement that Charles has certain accessibility aids to help him through his life, like these rails oh. on his bed to help him into his chair. Huh. Shaken, he still wheels himself down to the kitchen, where he attempts, through shaking hands, to pour himself a cup of coffee. Moira McTaggart walks in on the scene, quickly taking the coffee pot to fill his cup instead. He mentions the dream again, something they've apparently discussed, to which Moira encourages him to tell his X-Men. He despairs over how to tell his X-Men that he's going mad. Moira reassures him, though, and he at least physically relaxes enough to sip his morning coffee. Elsewhere, it seems that Alex Summers and Lorna Dane really have gotten on with their lives, now studying the Diablo mountain range. The pair share a brief kiss before Alex steps away from their small home. As he goes, Lorna returns inside, dwelling on their relationship and her happiness with it. Suddenly, a rap comes at the door. She's on guard, but comfortable that she can handle whoever's on the other side. But when she opens it, she's immediately blasted, though it's noteworthy that she notices she recognizes her attacker. Maybe you do too. Maybe not. No. Lorna isn't alone in her bliss over their relationship. As Alex crosses a natural stone arch, he too is full of love to the point of shouting it out to the world. Also, he shouldn't stand on that because there's a good chance it could break while he's on it. It's yeah. fine. I'm sure he studied it. He's a, he's a geologist. He wonders briefly if things are the same with his brother and Jean. Mm. Crossing. Jean hasn't been around at all. <laughs> no. Yeah, and, and uh, she had a date with a girl. <laughs> yeah. uh, she's moving on with her life. I'm sorry. Crossing that bridge makes him think more about his brother and how guarded he is. He wonders if Scott ever forgave him for getting adopted when he wasn't. Thinking on it, Alex vents off a blast into a nearby rock formation before kicking himself for it, as that's the exact rock he wanted to study. An idiot. Good job. (laughs) The stupidest Summer's brother, despite having a fucking degree, I guess. Whatever the fuck is going on with that timeline. You don't have to be smart to get a degree. (laughs) That's fair. He's an idiot. Oh, yeah. It seems he's probably been thinking on this a while, as right now, things aren't so hot between the brothers. With Scott upset over his brother leaving the team, and Alex just longing for a normal life. Suddenly, a scream cuts through the morning. Alex rushes for home, recognizing his girlfriend's scream, but when he returns, she's seemingly fine, just hanging up a wild new costume in the closet. Ah. Uh... 
Alex isn't satisfied with that. Why did she scream? That's when Lorna lashes out at him with her powers, proclaiming her... Proclaiming herself, finally, Polaris, Mistress of Magnetism. Oh boy! And the power of death? What? Magnets, sure, that equals death, right? <laughs> magnets, the power of death. Because Motherfucking magnets, how do they work? <laughs> <laughs> Her mysterious attacker from earlier praises Lorna as they look down on Alex, unconscious on the ground, soon unknowingly to join their posse when they come for Charles Xavier. Three days later, Charles is finally off for some much-needed R&R, accompanied to JFK by five of his students because that was just a thing you could do back in the (laughs) day. A thing I even remember people doing. That all changed because of 9-11. Yep. Jean Grey, Scott Summers, Aurora Monroe, Piotr Rasputin, and Kurt Wagner are the ones who've come to to the airport. Jean frets over her mentor, who reassures her that he very much can handle himself. Jean then asks after the missing member of the team, learning that Sean was spending some quality time with Moira, whereas Wolverine was feeling surly. Uh Jean momentarily delights over the hot goss on Sean and Moira before the professor finally heads down to the tarmac, bidding his X-Men goodbye. Jean is even allowed to accompany him to the plane. I'm fucking floored. (laughs) This is why the 60s and 70s had so many plane hijackings, I swear to fuck. Actually, that's not an unlikely thing. The professor then remembers that he's annoyed with Kurt using his image inducer to look like a dead movie star, as the intention was for him to use it to appear unobtrusive. And he tells Jean to make Kurt knock it off. What what movie star is he impersonating? I, I think... Clark Gable, maybe? Okay. I'm not 100% sure on that. I'm really bad at faces. We've got people in costumes in an airport. <laughs> Some people just look like celebrities. It's fine. Not, not that. That's not the part. That, oh, um, no, no, no. You're getting ahead of me. You us. are getting ahead of me. I Please can't don't. help. It's, it's right um, there. Look, two more far obtrusive figures cut through the crowd. Slowly, the X Men come to recognize Alex and Lorna, though they're both costumed up. Scott demands answers from his little brother, but Jean is the first one who realizes the ill intent. This is why all those hijackings (laughs) happened in the 60s. I don't like Lorna's new costume. It's very bad. It's bad. It doesn't go with her hair. I wish it wasn't purple, desperately. Um, She looks like Clea. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) It throws me off every time I see this costume. Jean shouts out a warning, and that's when shit hits the fan, as Lorna hits Jean hard, throwing her aside. He signed her own death warrant. Scott is outraged, yet again demanding answers, and this time getting at least one. They're here for Xavier, but Scott's not gonna have that. Neither are the pilot and first officer of the plane. Even as Alex snaps off a blast at his brother before he gets the chance to defend himself, the flight crew gun it away from the gate, keen to get out of here. Alex and Lorna are in hot pursuit of the plane. Scott bids the X-Men off to stop them, and Colossus and Nightcrawler take off after them. Both they and the pilots can tell Alex is readying to fire off another blast, though I don't know how considering he's behind them. I guess they're just assuming. Peter, were you wearing that under your clothes? Sure. Kurt tackles Summers around the midsection, but rather than stopping him from firing off the blast, he simply he simply throws it wild, blasting a nearby TWA. John? Uh, is that a 747? That is a 747. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't sure until I saw the small engines, because that's just one of those things. It's not a very good, uh, well, there's not a lot of plane, plane. <laughs> to, to judge from. You can just tell by how big it is. Yeah, and, and it does look like top it, ha- row. it does look like it has the top row, and there weren't a lot of those <laughs> back then. So yeah, even as ten pilot- points for John. Even as the pilots of Xavier's plane, a eh, John. Uh, I mean that's some kind of Lear something or other. It's a Learjet twenty four. <laughs> Two points for John. A half point. I don't. I don't know civilian. They got a ten for the first one, so okay. I'm and it's twelve a, points. And, and remember, that's a TWA seven point seven. <laughs> yeah, we've that, got a lot of. That's um, a real uh, airline. 
We've got a lot of airliners that are not around anymore in this. For a moment, all of the X-Men, including Havoc, stand in stunned horror before they realize that the plane was undergoing maintenance and no one was on board. Uh... Scott, yet again, demands answers of his brother, who just stammers in response, seemingly entirely confused. But luckily for everyone, the man behind the attempted assassination is here to take credit, and it's... Eric the Red? <laughs> but you, you can't be Eric the Red. I was Eric the Red. Yeah, Scott's understandably baffled by the revelation. It doesn't stop him from ordering the X-Men to get him. <laughs> the Eric quickly blasts the attacking X-Men aside. And not only, it sounds like this Eric the Red isn't a mutant, which is just weird. Curious. Alex, now of his own mind, rushes to his brother's side until Eric places himself in Havoc's path, demanding he stop. Havoc gets blasty, but Eric stops him in his tracks, grabbing him by the neck and lifting him off the ground to stare him in the eyes, where he blasts him with a hypno beam (laughs) to place him back under his power. Is that what that is? Okay, yeah. Um... Even as Cyclops tries to pull it together on the ground below. I'd like to note that Eric is a coward and chose to wear pants rather than short shorts. (sighs) Fucking God, we can't even have anything around here. (laughs) (laughs) I say, I want Eric the Red. Mom says, we have Eric the Red at home. (laughs) Eric the Red at home. Eric the Red at home has pants. (laughs) Boo. Boo. You may have noticed one member of the group absent from this kerfuffle. Storm flies through the skies, clutching the still unconscious Jean Grey to her side, looking for somewhere safe to set her so she can get back to the fight. She's at least glad that she's the only one in this kerfuffle that can fly. Uh, Why did Eric give Lorna a new costume anyway? Great question. Her old one was awesome. Who do you think made this? Eric did. He sewed it himself. <laughs> After he was done making his pants. Okay, okay. Now now we need we need the image of Eric the Red. With, Hunched over a sewing machine. With a thimble. Yes, with a thimble. <laughs> He's doing the sewing by hand. Well, Polaris defies Storm's expectations, using her control over magnetism to fly. Finally, on the same level, she blasts the pair. Though I would just like to take a moment to note that Aurora has absurdly large sleeves. <laughs> like, it makes a certain amount of sense with her costume, but this is for everyday streetwear. <laughs> she just, it's the look that she's going for, that's all. Every I... time you raise your arms, the audience gets excited that a show is about to begin. <laughs> <laughs> but oh yeah, that blast completely throws Storm for a loop, knocking Jean from her grasp. She tumbles downward as Aurora struggles to collect herself well enough to grab her. They both come dangerously near to the tarmac below. Storm is finally able to set Jane down on the rooftop of the airport so she can actually deal with this fight. They can't go on another date if Jean dies. She changes her clothes once more in a flash of lightning. Lorna Dane beware. Alex is still aware of his own self as he pleads with his brother to just let the trio go so this doesn't get ugly. But Scott won't have it. He wants to know what's going on, goddammit. Alex pleads that Eric is in his head, and despite Scott's encouragement, he can't break free, charging up to blast at his brother once more. Cyclops knows he can't take the hit, so instead he aims at the ground around his brother's feet. Hey, wait a second. I thought they weren't supposed to be able to hurt each other. Oh, yeah! (laughs) Their powers couldn't hurt each other! That was a thing! That is that a thing. That was totally a thing! That is still a thing. <laughs> Apparently Scott just forgot. <laughs> and, and Alex <laughs> forgot that he can't hurt Scott. Scott forgot he can't hurt Alex. But it's been, a, what, a month? And they they're forgot? Just, they've just got parental stuff. Stop hitting your brother ingrained <laughs> in your brains! <laughs> you, you're destroying the furniture! Don't make me turn this car around! Uh, because... We want to have a car to turn around, actually. (laughs) Well, he sends his little brother off balance. Alex similarly fights, aiming for the environment around him rather than at his brother proper. I don't want to hurt him. Though the effect is just the same as it knocks a wall down on top of the Elder Summer's brother. Arguably worse than if you had actually shot beams at him. Yes. Yes, actually. (laughs) This time when Alex runs for his brother, Eric does not intervene. Luckily, he pulls Scott from the rubble alive, if slightly worse for the wear. 
Still, Alex manages to help him to his feet, after which Scott gives him a right hook, knocking him right out the of the fight. The thing he can do to hurt his brother. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Eric the Red is still scrabbling with Nightcrawler and Colossus, the former of which crouches currently on his back. He flings Nightcrawler off, throwing him to dash him upon Colossus's unyielding metal mm-hmm. body. But in the nick of time, Kurt bamfs away, reappearing behind Eric once more. Kurt knows one trick. <laughs> now he stands stuck between the two as x men as they both charge. He doesn't have much trouble with Wagner, who has apparently not figured out that he is not the beefcake set to brute force his way through conflicts just yet. Colossus is a bit more of a struggle, but that doesn't stop him from flinging Piotr into the landing gear of a nearby plane that I thought at first was a, was a DC-10. I don't want to say that's an Airbus. Until I noticed the T-tail, so then I had to know... I want to say that's an Airbus. <clears throat> no? I'm going to state for the record that I believe this Eastern Airlines plane is a Hawker Sidley HS-121 Trident. Ooh. Which is definitely not a rabbit hole. Of I fell course, down as at we all know. four <laughs> in the morning. That's a, wow, that is, that's, that's deep. <laughs> Zero points for John. <laughs> Ten points for Ripley. <laughs> Well, anyway, that tears the wing straight off the plane in what is proving to be a very expensive flight. Uh, th- and there aren't people on this one, right? Hopefully, but like at least they if, didn't destroy right. the cabin of this one. Right, so if it they is are, still they a, could just get so off on the... it is still the, a fire risk. Yeah. They can get off on the inflatable slide. <laughs> <laughs> the land four feet up in the air still. <laughs> Kurt rushes to the debris left behind, concerned over Piotr's fate. But Colossus from Russia emerges from the debris unscathed, throwing a landing gear Eric's way for the trouble. (laughs) He's fine, and he's got a weapon. Finally, Eric lays still, out of the fight. But the airport is not peaceful just yet. Instead, the dark sky still crackles with energy overhead as Polaris and Storm battle it out. Polaris sees no way for either to overpower one or the other, offering to call their little game a draw. But that outrageous storm. The thought that she'd call this a game, considering how many people could have been hurt? Aurora unleashes her fury on Polaris, who is probably reevaluating the math on that one. Uh, not a game? Not a game! (laughs) She plummets towards the ground, screaming all the way. Considering that Alex was just earlier screaming about how much he loves his girlfriend, he doesn't take it all that well. Blasting his brother out of the way and shouting that if she's dead, he'll kill all of them as he runs over to her side. Eric's back up and at him in this never-ending fight that is now getting additional combatants. It seems Wolverine and Banshee got the old mental telegram and are here to join the fight. Not liking his odds, Eric rushes to Havoc and Polaris, who is apparently at least alive, if kind of out of it. With a mutant in each arm, Eric the Red activates his rocket boots. <laughs> what? A new feature for this costume, for sure. <laughs> Is that why he has pants? <laughs> I was wondering about that, Possibly. Ashley. They're heat shields. <laughs> 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 Gotta protect the goods. Cyclops threatens to shoot them down, but ultimately just can't bring himself to fire on his little brother. Which Wolverine just cannot understand. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Reasonable. Wolverine calls him gutless for not taking the shot, and Psych finally snaps, oh. belting someone good for the second time wow. today. Man, he must have broke his hand, too. <laughs> he gotta feel like he it. He backhanded him. Yeah. I just, that gotta break something, because, <laughs> you know, metal bones! Man has metal bones, and you just backhanded him! I mean, you can hit him in the gu- in the gushier parts. <laughs> of what, his face? Yeah, the cheek. The shoulder. So <laughs> he doesn't have that much gush. <laughs> he's bone and muscle, and that's it. Bullshit. He's fat. <laughs> <laughs> I think Wolverine should be fat. I don't personally. think. See, I feel like he's just big. Like he's built, so he's not just like muscle and bone. He's got some pushing. Okay. He should be he should be a weightlifter, not a bodybuilder. Mm. Built like a mini fridge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> a little on the round side, but uh, do not mess with him. Yep. Well, anyway, he lands in a crouch, claws out, ready to go, but he stayed by Aurora, kept in line by the threat that he'll answer to her if he tries it. 
We then get a panel that is Eric the Red watching Dr. Lang watching Cyclops storm away from the group. What is okay. this vi- What is this Inception view going on here? <laughs> Why is someone filming this? Why is someone filming someone filming this? Last but not least, we have the B story uh, of classic X-Men 5. Just what? The Sentinels Return, next issue. That's enough fine. said. Yeah, enough said. <laughs> Last but not least, we have the B story of Classic X-Men 5 from October of 1986. Written by Chris Claremont, penciled and inked by John Bolton, colored by Glynis Ween, and lettered by Tom Orzachowski. Piotr Rasputin sits on Brighton Beach, sketching the beachgoers around him. He comes here from time to time, to Little Odessa, where live a large population of Soviet immigrants. It's a small taste of home when so much around him has changed. His collective farm community was so small that he knew everybody at least by face, if not by name. But here, millions of people, buildings taller than he'd ever imagined possible. It's all a bit much to adjust to. Suddenly, his peaceful sketching is brought to an abrupt halt when he hears the sound of a girl screaming in Russian down below as two men wrestle her into a yellow sedan. Pyotr doesn't even hesitate, leaping over the rail of the pier he stands atop onto the car below. The driver speeds away, but he holds on, even as he tries to shake him. Still, this could get dangerous for everyone involved, so he shifts, now able to punch a massive metal fist through the roof of the car. One of the men in the back attempts to open fire, but the bullet just ricochets off Colossus's skin. Still, the driver tries to throw him off the top of the car, finally just crashing it into a fucking wall. Good job! For a moment, it seems that this has finally done Colossus in. But before he can back away, the front end of the car begins to lift high up into the air until it finally crashes back down onto the pavement. The thugs dash, and finally Colossus can rescue his damsel in distress. She remains asleep, and he finds her very beautiful, and wonders if she would find him a monster if she knew his secret. But Piotr opts not to chance it, reverting back to his usual form, just as she begins to stir. Both she and the locals from the neighborhood are very appreciative of his efforts, and luckily for him, the men he was sketching at the pier saved his book and bag for him, remarking on his nice sketches. Luckily for Mr. Goo Goo Eyes, the girl he rescued stuck around to introduce herself to Piotr. She is Anya Marakova, a one-time prima ballerina for the Kirov Ballet. As they wait at the subway platform, she begins to dance, explaining how she longed for the freedom to fully express herself when and where she wants, and that's why she's come here to America. That was way... This is 1980? 1986. This, that was significant in the eyes of us, anyway. She may be feeling a little too free about where and when to perform, though, as she is nearly hit by an approaching subway train. <laughs> uh... <laughs> Luckily, Piotr is able to pull her to safety in time yet again, so the pair can board the train. They sit beside one another, continuing their discussion. Tonight is her debut performance in New York, and she hopes it goes well, even as Piotr worries that she'll never be able to return home. Anya then points out that he's kind of being a hypocrite since he's here too. (laughs) She then explains that the thugs who nabbed her were sent by her father to drag her back home to the Soviet Union. Her heart is here and now, though, with both her life in general, her career, and her creeping case of the hots for Piotr, her (laughs) big hunky hero. So much so that she invites him to watch the performance with the Handel Company at Lincoln Center. When Piotr watches her perform, he's entranced, much like most of the audience around him, delighting in her performance. She sees him briefly afterward, but asks him to wait up a few moments. And so Piotr Rasputin parks himself outside the stage door, waiting first one hour, then another. He must really be taken with this girl. (laughs) Finally, she exits, a large bouquet of roses in hand. Apparently, she has many such back in her dressing room. But he has his own gift for Anya, straight from the heart, a sketch of her dancing, which he passes over. She then offers her bear, a token in return, one of the roses plucked from her bouquet. They both know things are going too fast, but swept away by the tide of emotion, they embrace, sealing the deal with a kiss in the moonlight. Aww. They walk all the way back to little Odessa, and by the time they arrive, the dawn light has brightened the world around them. But no one is yet about. 
even as they strolled down the pier by Brighton Beach, where they first met only a day ago. It seems so long ago. <laughs> that doesn't stop Anya from asking Pyotr to stay with her forever. Oh my god, that did it just implied they had sex. It's getting the feeling this gal's a little bit clingy. <laughs> um, that starts to happen around when this came out. Yeah, all like, you can do is imply. We it. just went from, uh, uh, this is very sudden. Things are happening so fast. Perhaps too fast? I know. I don't care. Next page. It's the next day, and they're still together. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they had sex. It, they they stayed start together. implying it around this point. It can get a lot more explicit in some places. There's mm. a couple places in Thor, actually, where it gets fairly explicit. Like, <laughs> a lot of the time it's just kind of a fade to black. Like, yes. This. Like, I just, this is probably the first time I've encountered that kind of... It's nowhere by near the first time you run into it chronologically with oh, other comics, oh yeah. but... I'm sure, but it's the first It's time a first for us. And from what I've actually read, you, you know, it's all post-2000. Very soon after, they could do what they wanted. They could even make a comic where <laughs> Hank goes inside shit. No! Die! Die, 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 die! Die! No! Fuck you! Fuck you! I You have me trapped in this corner. I can't walk away. <laughs> that was the plan. Yeah. <laughs> well, they're not along at the pier for long. A suited man comes up, interjecting that, yeah, forever's not gonna happen. Piotr tells Suits and his toughs to beat it, but instead, he just moves to grab the gun from his suit jacket pocket. Piotr can be shot. Colossus, not so much. So Piotr changes to metal, right before the astonished eyes of his beloved Anya. And the toughs, who thought their friends Ritskov and Dimyatin had gotten into the wabka. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's little work for Colossus to throw the thugs over the side of the pier, and they land on the beach below, scrambling away. But when he turns back to Anya, rather than relieved that they might finally let her be, she's horrified and furious. She feels betrayed and lied to, not viewing Piotr as a man, but only a monster. He pleads for her to remember their love, but she just throws his crumpled drawing back at him as she runs away in tears, yelling behind her that a man of steel has no heart. Wow. Ouch. That was a really fast 180. Yeah. Yeah. I think Anya needs some help. Yeah, agreed. I mean, she's a ballerina, so that's <laughs> not shocking. They're all kind of messed up. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you start at No like, offense to any ballerinas <laughs> out there, but like... Professional ballerinas start seek as... Seek help. They start as children. It's ballerinas out there, send us your takes. <laughs> Come explaining at gmail.com. Yeah. <laughs> ballerinas out uh, there in the audience. Especially ballerinas with experience uh, coming from the former Soviet Union. Oh, yeah. That's a very, very specific demographic. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure we have tons of listeners who. That's probably are in all that 14 of our YouTubers. Yeah. <laughs> Pyotr Rasputin disagrees, though. He has a heart, one torn in two, which, after a whole day spent dwelling on their brief love affair, is the same way he leaves Anya's drawing, torn in half as he finally heads tw- through the night towards home. Ouch. This, this page hurts. Yeah, it's rough, right? But. Like, it's meant to, and it does a good job at hurting. How would you rate our stories? First, we have Kirok and the Ingarai. Uh, two out of five? That was a... Mostly <laughs> incoherent. It, the, the only <laughs> interesting part of the story was the deep B story. Well, about... the B story wasn't part of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah the, the very, very deep B story that barely had any... Doesn't have an impact yet. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so, you so, haven't yeah. rated... I'll go with, what, two? Yeah, two, two is what I said. Two. I'm going to go with two and a half. It's um not very good. These are some of the not as good entries by mm-hmm. Mr. Claremont, but from the second one is where we start to get some momentum. How, how do we feel about Kurt and Wolvie's Night on the Town? Uh, five out of five. That, that, I was, loved that it. was excellent. Yep, five out of five. I love it 100%. That felt like really queer, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it wasn't even too subtle about it with trans uh, vibes. <laughs> I mean, the 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 bar guy. Am I out here? Am I going to declare a second X Men character trans? <laughs> you know I am. Fuck yeah. And, 
and we know that barman was uh <laughs> <laughs> harry harry liked what he saw oh yeah <laughs> He's into it. Third, we have the aircraft identification hour. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that was just a lot, and it was... It was weird. Like, I gather it was the beginning of something, so it's kind of hard for me to rate it without knowing where it goes from there, because it was mostly just confusing, because yeah. we don't know what the fuck was happening. But it's suppo- if it is supposed to be confusing? Yeah. So I'll give it credit for that. But even then, it did make some dumb decisions, like a new outfit. Ugh, that outfit <laughs> uh, is so fucking They forgot bad. they can't Oh, I thought you were other. talking about Eric's pants at first. <laughs> oh, yeah. Eric's pants and also Lorna's new outfit. Yes. Both terrible fashion but, choices. But also, uh, they they can't hurt each other, guys. Uh, Cyclops and... I can't Havoc. Remember, and Havoc. It's right in front of you. <laughs> Where? Down, my brother, my enemy. Oh, all the way over there. Yeah. Cyclops and Havoc can't hurt each other. This was established canon. Now they can? I mean, Uh, I I guess they can if they drop parts of buildings on each other. That that, that will hurt. That will hurt. That will definitely hurt. Categorically, yes. Uh, Guys, guys, that kills people. Dropping buildings, or at least parts of buildings, on your brother kills people. I'm, I didn't love this one. I'm still going to go with the three because it was better than the last one. It was a comic. It yeah. was. It needs some work, but it's like you said, it's going somewhere. I was going to say three, yeah. And it might get better if where it goes. Once we get context. Yeah, yeah. it might be better in retrospect because... Yeah, it's definitely the start of How about that big something. old splash page of Charles's Nightmare, though? That's fucking Ooh. gorgeous. Yeah, that was amazing. I mean, the art in these is rather good. And last but not least, we have Piotr's Bad Date Night. Oh, five. my heart. Yeah. Five out of five. Five. Yeah. Poor, poor guy. So when we start off, all these B stories are written by Chris, and they hit hard. Yeah. And so they're... Like, and they're Chris a decade in his career. They're Chris yes. in his prime. This is him at the middle towards the end of his mm-hmm. X-Men run. He's He knows what he's doing yeah. now. He know, he's hitting it. He knows how to hit it out of the park, pretty much. After this, though, the X-Men books start getting better themselves. Because we start seeing Chris. And after a while, there. it swaps over apart from one notable story later. Mm. But we'll get there when we get there. And when we get there, we'll be much later than any of the others. I mean, it makes sense. Uh, we're reading uh, extras by Chris Claremont from a decade later. Yep. And once that stops, Chris Claremont starts to become the guy he will be a decade later. Yep. If Scott folded the top of his boots up, they would be knee highs. I think he should do that. Yes. I think so too. <laughs> also, um, Havoc, have some contrast. Okay. Have anything else on your costume. Okay, I... I hate all black costumes. I kind of like the way they do Havoc's costume, actually, because it's very stark. Like, I don't know. It I guess has, it does kind of stand out. It has a weird vibe to me. I'm not sure it works for him because his power is mostly just shooting beams. Yeah. (laughs) But I think in the right place, it could be a cool idea in all completely black costume with a little bit of white details. I think so. You are you would be a fan of the black suit Spider Man costume, maybe? Because that's what (laughs) uh, that's where my brain was going. I don't know. It's just the fact that it's all black with that little bit of white makes it look more like a silhouette. Yeah. Okay, I th- I can see where you're going with that. I still don't like it. It's not my cup of tea, but hey. Mm-hmm. And I also think that that makes it so that the artist has to do a lot more with his posing. Because if he has his limbs too close to himself, you can't fucking see them. <laughs> yeah, he does look really Dynamic. cool on this page. Mm-hmm. I'll give you that. But I that, still hate the head part, though. The headpiece <laughs> is terrible. You, you and the, the mask. He- you mean the headpiece he never gets rid of? Yep. That's the one I mean. The one that he still wears to this day. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's not that far off. He basically never changes his outfit. He, there are tweaks. Tw- like, to his fa- face. To his headpiece, in fact. That's going to be it for us today on the comics front. Ballerinas, don't forget to send your, don't forget to send your comments. <laughs> Especially to, former Soviet ballerinas. Especially f- former Soviet ballerinas, but we will take... Any ballerinas, send, send us your, your hate mail. Send us your hate mail to comicsplaining at gmail.com. 
You can also find us on social media. We're on Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Come explaining all those places. We also, next week, are going to be recording our next comic book mini comic book mini-sode. So join us over on Patreon at the $5 tier or more if you want to see our new bad comics. Where John is going to be hosting, we've decided. Mm. Yep, we get to, we've made a few adjustments. That's the plan. John's hosting, and we get to have the surprises for once. <laughs> <laughs> so check us out over on Patreon for that. We also have a coffee if you just want to throw a couple bucks our way. But no sweat if you can't do any of that. The most important thing you can do is rate and review us and recommend us to your friends. But hey... If you want to check us out over on YouTube, we put up a video version of the show every week where you can kind of see the things we're talking about. Like we're sitting here talking about Havoc's costume. That's something much easier to see on the screen oh, yeah. than it is to talk about it. Some things are just like that. And that's why you can sub like, subscribe, hit the bell button, comment, hit us up over on YouTube. We put up that, we put this up every week just the same. Go ahead, read the issues for yourself, and join us over at our comic book club on our Discord, which we link to every week in the description of the episode. All that said and done, we're going to be back at you next week with Thor, and we look forward to talking to you then. Bye! Bye! Bye.